name is Nikki Strong, and this is VOA1. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ashley Thompson. And I'm Dan Novak. This program is designed for English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today, John Russell has a report on the rise in artificial intelligence drone technology. Brian Lynn presents this week's Health and Lifestyle Report. Dan Novak tells listeners what they can expect from tomorrow's education report. Finally, we hear today's lesson of the day. But first... United States and Chinese military planners are preparing for a new kind of warfare. The warfare of the future is likely to involve groups of air and sea drones equipped with artificial intelligence, or AI. These drones would use AI to swarm like bees to overcome an enemy. The U.S. Defense Department is pushing for the development of drones because they are less costly. The U.S. says it has no choice but to keep up with China. Chinese officials say AI-enabled weapons are inevitable, so they, too, must have them. Both countries are developing drone swarm technology for military purposes. Such technology permits groups of drones to work together, often without human control. Margarita Konayev is with Georgetown University's Center for Security and Emerging Technology, or CSET. Konayev said the uncontrolled spread of drone swarm technology could lead to more instability and conflict around the world. As AI superpowers, the U.S. and China can set an example by putting limits on military uses of drone swarms. But the two countries' competition makes cooperation look unlikely. The idea of placing restrictions on drone technology is not new. The United Nations has tried for more than ten years to limit drones. Possible restrictions include the targeting of civilians or banning the use of drone swarms for ethnic cleansing. Drones have been important for both powers for years, and each side has kept its technologies secret. In 2023, Georgetown's CSET released a study of AI-related military spending. It found that more than one-third of known contracts issued by both U.S. and Chinese military services over eight months in 2020 were for intelligent, uncrewed systems. Lorenz Meyer is chief and founder of Aterian, a company developing drone software that directs drones to work together for the U.S. military and its allies. In a discussion with reporters about drones, Meyer said, We're enabling a single operator to direct right now half a dozen. He said that number is expected to increase to dozens and, within a year, to hundreds. China's military claimed last year that dozens of aerial drones self-healed after radio jamming cut their communications. An official Chinese government documentary video said they regrouped and switched to self-guidance. The drones completed a search-and-destroy mission unaided, striking a target as planned. Just before he died last year, former U.S. Secretary of State Henry Kissinger urged China and the U.S. to work together to discourage AI arms spread 
or proliferation. The countries have a narrow window of opportunity, he said. With Harvard's Graham Allison, Kissinger wrote that restrictions were needed before AI is built into the security structure of each society. President Joe Biden and Chinese President Xi Jinping made a spoken agreement in November to set up working groups on AI safety. That effort has not made progress so far. The competition is not likely to build trust or reduce the risk of conflict, said William Hartung of the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft in Washington, D.C. If the U.S. is going full speed ahead, it's most likely China will accelerate whatever it's doing, Hartung said. Some experts say there is a risk that swarm technology might be given away or stolen. Other countries developing the technology, such as Russia, Israel, Iran, and Turkey, could also spread it. U.S. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan said in January that U.S.-China talks set to begin this spring will cover AI safety. Neither the Defense Secretary's Office nor the National Security Council would comment on whether the military use of drone swarms might be a subject of discussion. The Chinese Foreign Ministry did not answer an Associated Press request for comment. I'm John Russell. A new study has found that 41% of cancer drugs receiving accelerated government approval do not improve survival or quality of life. The U.S. Food and Drug Administration's FDA's accelerated approval program aims to get new drugs to patients as quickly as possible but the effectiveness of the drugs differs. The program was created in 1992 to speed up the approval of HIV drugs. Today, about 85% of accelerated approvals go to cancer drugs. The program helps the FDA collect data on early results of approved drugs. In exchange, drug companies are expected to use the data to do additional testing. They are to produce better evidence before drugs receive normal approval. The new study suggests most cancer drugs given accelerated approval do not improve or extend patients' lives within five years. Dr. Ezekiel Emanuel is a cancer specialist and bioethicist at the University of Pennsylvania. He was not involved in the research. Emanuel told the Associated Press, AP, he thinks five years should be enough time to examine the effectiveness of new drugs. Thousands of people are getting those drugs. That seems a mistake if we don't know whether they work or not, he added. It is up to the FDA or the drug company to withdraw drugs that do not perform well. Sometimes the FDA decides that less clear evidence is good enough to give full approval. The new study found that between 2013 and 2017, 46 cancer drugs were given accelerated approval. Of those, 63% were moved to normal approval. 
43% demonstrated a good medical result in tests. The study was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association. It was also discussed at the recent meeting of the American Association for Cancer Research in San Diego, California. Dr. Edward Cliff of Harvard Medical School was a co-writer of the study. He told the AP it is unclear how much cancer patients understand about drugs with accelerated approval. We raise the question, is that uncertainty being conveyed to patients? He said, Drugs that received accelerated approval may be the only chance for patients with rare or advanced cancers, said Dr. Jennifer Litton. She is with the MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. Litton, who was not involved with the study, said it is important for doctors to carefully explain the evidence. It might be shrinking of tumor. It might be how long the tumor stays stable, Litton said. You can provide the data you have, but you shouldn't overpromise. Congress recently changed the program to give the FDA more power and to simplify the process of withdrawing drugs when companies do not meet their commitments. The changes permit the FDA to withdraw approval for a drug approved under accelerated approval when appropriate more quickly, said FDA spokesperson Sherry Duval-Jones. The agency can now require that confirmatory tests be started when the agency gives the first approval. This can speed up the process of confirming how effective a drug is, Duval Jones said. I'm Brian Lynn. Is here now to talk more about his health and lifestyle report. Hi, Brian. Thanks for joining me. Of course, Ashley. Thanks for having me. This week, you reported on a new study that examined the effectiveness of newly approved cancer drugs in the U.S. The report describes the Food and Drug Administration's Accelerated Approval Program. Can you explain how that program works? Yes, this FDA program is designed to get drugs out to the public as quickly as possible uh, without going through the agency's full approval process. And these are drugs that have shown promise in preliminary trials but might not become available for years if going through the normal approval process um, many of these are drugs targeting cancer, and as mentioned, the program has been around since 1992, but particularly in recent years, uh, the way it is administered has increasingly been criticized by members of Congress and some independent groups. What has this criticism centered on, and has it had any effects on the FDA's process? So one of the main criticisms is that drugs given accelerated approval have not undergone enough follow-up studies to confirm whether they are effective or not. One recent report noted, for example, that about 40% of drugs given accelerated approvals still had incomplete confirmation studies. Another major criticism is that some drug makers have not been willing to take accelerated drugs off the market uh, when asked by the FDA to do so, even without providing new research data to support the effectiveness of the medications. Now, this criticism has resulted in some slowing of the accelerated process during the past five years, 
but the FDA is still facing calls in Congress uh, to reform its approval process or face possible new rules. Okay, thanks again for joining me, Brian, and thanks for that report. You're welcome. Thank you, Ashley. VOA Learning English has launched a new program for children. It is called Let's Learn English with Anna. The new course aims to teach children American English through asking and answering questions and experiencing fun situations. For more information, visit our website, learningenglish.voanews.com. education report, Dan Novak, is reporting on attempts to increase punishments for librarians who distribute banned books. Dan is here now to give a little preview of that report. Dan, what more can you tell us about tomorrow's story? Hi, Ashley. Yes, so I've written a handful of stories about book bans and censorship in American schools. There's been a large increase of bans or attempted bans in the past couple years, but now states are taking it a step further and introducing punishments for librarians and even teachers who continue to distribute books that some consider obscene or inappropriate. We're talking about really high fines or even jail time. Who decides what is obscene? Yeah, that's, as we say, the million-dollar question. Missouri, for example, has a law banning sexually explicit material from schools. The law is very broad or hard to define, so now school systems are having to look at individual books and decide whether or not they are sexually explicit according to the Missouri law. One book I talk about in the story tomorrow had one single page that could be considered sexually explicit, and so the school system decided to remove it from the curriculum. And it's important to note that many books targeted for censorship deal with either queer issues or are from a writer of color. Okay. Dan, I'm looking forward to hearing that story tomorrow and talking with you more about it then. Thanks again for being here. You're welcome. My name is Andrew Smith. And I'm Jill Robbins. You're listening to the Lesson of the Day on the Learning English Podcast. Welcome to the part of the show where we help you do more with our series, Let's Learn English. The series shows Ana Mateo in her work and life in Washington, D.C. In Washington, D.C., you can get to many places by using the bus or metro train. And a lot of people use bicycles or scooters to get from one place to another. But it can still be useful to have a car. And that's why Anna wants to get her driver's license. The license gives her legal permission to drive a car. To get the license, she has to take her driving test on a Saturday. In Lesson 21 of the Let's Learn English series, Anna's friend Marcia invites her to a party. The party is on Saturday, so Anna thinks she can't go to it because of her driving test. Let's listen. Hey, Anna. My friend is having a party on Saturday. Can you come with me? Sorry, I can't come with you. I have to get my driver's license. 
Will you be busy all day? I don't know. First, I have to take a test on the computer. Then I have to take a test in the car. But you have to take the test during the day, don't you? Yes. Luckily, Anna learns that the party is at night. The party is at night. Oh, then I can come with you to the party on Saturday night. Great! I have to help my friend with the party. Can you help me? Sure. That sounds like fun. In a previous lesson of the day, Andrew and I explained how speakers of English change the pronunciation of the verb can when they talk more quickly. Can changes to kun. Listen again to Anna and Marsha. In these sentences, they mostly pronounce the verb can with slower speech. The party is at night. Oh, then I can come with you to the party on Saturday night. Great! I have to help my friend with the party. Can you help me? Sure, that sounds like fun. Everyone has to bring something or do something. You can bring food or you can perform. Really? I can perform? You can. Can you? Yes, I can recite poetry. Did you notice that the more Anna wanted to emphasize or make her meaning clear, the slower she said the word can? Oh, then I can come with you to the party on Saturday night. Speaking a little faster, the pronunciation starts to change. Really? I can perform? And a little later, Marcia says, Anna, maybe you can just bring food. And if Jill quickly tells me that she can help me tomorrow, it sounds like this. I can do it tomorrow. Now, we're going to show another example of how we change vowel sounds and reduce words. Reducing means we make words shorter and faster. This next example uses the two words, have to. When Anna and Marcia say those two words quickly, the sound changes. First, listen to the slower speech. Sorry, I can't come with you. I have to get my driver's license. Will you be busy all day? I don't know. First, I have to take a test on the computer. Then I have to take a test in the car. But you have to take the test during the day, don't you? Now, listen to the faster speech. First, you'll hear Marcia. Then Anna. Now I have to go shopping for food. I have to help Marcia shop. Now listen to Jill and me say have to in a short conversation. So, Jill, what are you doing later this afternoon? I have to look at the comments on our YouTube channel. How about you? Well, uh, I have to do a lot of things. I have to check my camera. I have to review some notes for a story. I have to go to the grocery store. I have to, uh, what else do I have to do? Oh, I have to clean up some things and I have to get ready for tomorrow. Whoa, do you really have to do all that? Can't you wait and do some of it tomorrow? I guess I don't have to get it all done, but I'd rather do it sooner. I'd rather means that you prefer to do something or be something. So, Jill, would you rather be a hammer or a nail? <laughs> well, I don't think I would want to be either. But if I had to choose, I would be a hammer. But I'd rather be a bird than a hammer. Me too. We're going to talk more about the phrase, I'd rather, in another lesson of the day. I'm Jill Robbins, and you're listening to the lesson of the day on the Learning English Podcast. Now, let's go back to Lesson 21. Listen to these two sentences and see if you can identify or name the subject and verb of each sentence. 
Everyone has to bring something or do something. Nobody recites poetry at parties. Did you hear the subject and verb? In the first example, they were the words everyone has. And in the second one, they were the words nobody recites. Recites means to say something aloud, usually from memory, like a poem, speech, or the words to a song. There is something interesting about the subjects of those sentences. In fact, the words are so special that everyone studies them in English class. Andrew, when you think of everyone, do you think of one or more than one person? Well, of course, I think of more than one. Yeah, you're thinking of lots of people, but here is why the word "everyone" is special. Listen to the example again. Everyone has to bring something or do something. Marcia says everyone has. Everyone means more than one person, but the verb "has" agrees with a singular subject. So that's how the word is special. The word "nobody" follows the same rule. We can think about more than one person when we say "nobody," but the verb agrees with a singular subject. Listen. Nobody recites poetry at parties. Here are some more words that can refer to more than one person or thing, but that take a verb that agrees with a singular subject. The words are every, everyone, nobody, somebody, someone, everybody, anybody, and anyone. In English-speaking countries, everybody learns the grammar rule for those words in school. But not everyone remembers them. And some people may not feel it sounds natural to follow that rule with the word every. Here is a sentence you can use to help you remember the rule. Every window needs washing. And here's some words from a song. Everybody loves somebody sometime. Ah, yes, I know that song. Are you going to sing that, Jill? Yeah, everybody loves somebody sometime. Sounds good to me. Thanks. But there's a famous recording of that song by Dean Martin that sounds a lot better. Well, Jill, what's the plan for our next lesson of the day? I'm still working on that, but you just said something that gives me an idea. In lesson twenty-two of Let's Learn English, Anna is planning her new show for children. Her producer Amelia asks her about it. Let's listen. So, Anna, what's the plan for the show? When we say "What's the plan for?", that's just another way of saying "What will happen?" or "What are we going to do?" And we say "What's the plan for?" when we are doing something together with another person or persons. Tune in for our next podcast when we listen in on Anna making plans with her producer Amelia. Thanks for listening to the lesson of the day on the Learning English podcast. I'm Jill Robbins, and I'm Andrew Smith. Our program for today. Join us again tomorrow to keep learning English through stories from around the world. I'm Ashley Thompson, and I'm Dan Novak.